Thanks, Marie. Uh, welcome, everybody. This is our first in a series uh, of lessons in leadership in times of crisis. Um, I'm Sarah Mendelson. I'm head of Carnegie Mellon University's Heinz College in Washington, DC, and a distinguished service professor of public policy. Uh, I'm joined today by Tony Pippa, who's a senior fellow in the Global Development Team at the Brookings Institution. Uh, Tony is a colleague from our days back at USAID, um, where we worked on a lot of stuff together. But we're going to go even further back in time to Tony's experience working on the ground soon after Hurricane Katrina hit the United States. So Tony, let's start. Where were you when it happened? And what were you doing when the crisis came? So I had just completed a master's degree, a mid-career degree in master's of public administration at the Harvard Kennedy School. I uh, graduated that May. So the, if, if you recall, the, uh, the hurricane hit at the end of August. Um, I, in fact, just turned down a job offer from Senator John Edwards, uh, who was then to become a candidate for vice president, um, and was, had some consulting lined up. And uh, through connections at the Kennedy School was asked to go down and be part of a group working with the governor and in the governor's office. It was a call from the governor's chief of staff, the governor of Louisiana, to help set up a foundation uh, that was that would make use of all the private donations that were that immediately started to flood into the governor's office after the uh, after the crisis occurred. So you're your first job is essentially to help distribute the funds? So, um, so I had been the founding executive director of a private foundation in North Carolina. I had also worked at a community foundation, but I was very not only familiar with uh, philanthropic structures, but also had created one from scratch. Uh, so I was part of a group of philanthropic leaders from across the country that uh, the chief of staff convened um, cognizant of the reputation that Louisiana had for uh, political shenanigans and potential corruption. Uh, they wanted to create a, a, a foundation that was arm's length from government, that was independent, but was publicly minded and would be uh, an important part of the recovery that they knew was going to have to occur. So I was on the ground about a week after the levees broke in New Orleans. Uh, New Orleans still was not open. They were actually still looking for, uh, for, for people and, uh, in New Orleans. It was in Baton Rouge. And over the course of a couple of days, a group of about 10 of us, people who had worked, who were working at the Ford Foundation, people who were working in philanthropy from across the US, put the structure together for a foundation that would manage these funds, that could get it up and running quite quickly and start to, as you say, distribute funds. But we were also focused on how we would make best use of those funds. Uh, we understood that the funds themselves were gonna pale in comparison probably to the public money that would be spent for relief and recovery. Uh, so we were trying to take that into account, what, what gap and what particular place would these uh, funds fit. And uh, there was also major fundraising going on. In fact, former uh, presidents Clinton and Bush started to raise money and uh, they were, we were seeing this as a potential vehicle to collect some of the funds that they would raise. Uh, so we could leverage also money that was happening, you know, that was that was happening through national fundraising. But you you hadn't had a lot of experience in emergency response, and there you are yeah. suddenly in a complete emergency. Yeah. So what were your first impressions, and how did those change over time? Uh, so first was the intensity of it, uh, right? Um, and also uh, a bit of chaos, right? Uh, we were creating a process from scratch that was trying to both put a group of people together, some of us who already knew each other because of our philanthropic networks, but other people who didn't, uh, together with local leaders as well. Um, in the midst of chaos, uh, the, the capacity was overwhelmed on all fronts. So state government capacity was overwhelmed. Uh, I had had an experience mm. in North Carolina where uh, sort of a 
similar size geographically of a state, but uh, many more people in government. Uh, so you could you could just see the the amount of work that people who are working for state government were and pressure they were under sort of 24 seven uh, capacity overwhelmed uh, from the nonprofit sector as well. The American Red Cross had half as many centers in Louisiana as they did in North Carolina. Again, a fairly similar geographic footprint, but yet much less capacity and obviously uh, we're not being able to reach all the people who were were being affected. And so you had uh, civil society repurposing itself like at the at the drop of a hat. Um, and we were putting together, you know, a structure uh, and did so really over the course of a weekend uh, <laughs> that it takes usually maybe a year to, to work through sort of the process of developing what's your mission, your vision, your uh, your bylaws, your articles of incorporation, you know, who your initial board of directors might be. Um, so that intensity I expected, you mm -hmm. know, and that chaos, but what, what, was, um, what was instructive to me is how long that intensity stayed. Yeah. And we got to start talking about it as we're running, a we're running a marathon at a sprint's pace every day. And that stayed for quite a long time. Um, I mean, that, that went beyond the year into years to, to be thinking in, that, in those terms. So that takes a toll on people's mental health. That, yes. that can be physically exhausting. How did you, how did you deal with that at the time? Uh, it's interesting. I mean, you, um, you build relationships quickly and those relationships are sort of forged in the fire of crisis mm -hmm. and you start to rely on people and people's, uh, you know, sort of kindness and people are willing to sort of share and support in ways that I think are unusual, just in sort of the Monday, everyday rhythms of, of life. Um, and, uh, and you really start to rely on people that you didn't really know very well uh, before you went there and uh, you build a relationship quite quickly that, that seeks to sustain you. You also do have to take time. Uh, you simply, you know, there would be days when we would just step away from the work, go outside, take deep breaths, take a walk, do something, decompress, um, uh, you know, uh, play a piece of music, rely right. on a piece of art, uh, even just conversation or food uh, as a way to sort of sustain yourself. Um, so what are some of the most striking memories that you take away from that experience? Uh, so one is the amount of creativity that the nonprofit sector and civil society actually showed in the midst of both the immediate crisis and then even going on to recovery. Um, you know, organizations that were built for one purpose very quickly pivoted to serve the needs of the community in which they were serving. Uh, and they were really important to what was happening because they had the trust of those particular constituencies right. or communities. So local stakeholders. Local stakeholders were, uh, it, it was amazing. Um, secondly was the, uh, the amount of policy that got made <laughs> in a very short amount of time with a lot of pressure and a lot of responsibility sort of all at once. And then the opportunities that that provided for leadership to come from many different places. Right, you know, isn't that so interesting? I mean, I have, a, I have, a, I have a, a very vivid memory of a colleague who was actually brought down to sort of be a note taker for the group of us who had, you know, been professionals and leading foundations, you know, and he was uh, fresh out of college, uh, you know, young 20 something. Uh, the space that we had to work in was sometimes makeshift. And so we had just had a meeting actually at an early childhood development organization. So we were on like small chairs and <laughs> tables, you know, built for kids. And he had a laptop balanced on his knee and he was literally writing up the structure for the sort of quasi-public agency that would later um, 
you know, receive about six billion dollars in federal aid and then, you know, uh, give it out um, and create the policy that needed to do that. And, you know, I mean, he was being incredible and and uh, a speechwriter for the governor's uh, first speech as they were starting to reopen the city uh, mm -hmm. after the levees had broke, you know, was someone who actually, again, you know, someone just out of college, came down to Louisiana, didn't really know Louisiana, didn't know the governor, but we needed extra hands on deck, had participated in our process, so had really learned about what the implications were uh, and, you know, helped provide a lot of the structure for the speech that the governor made. Uh, that particular day and went on to serve actually in her administration in her executive office for the next couple of years as the recovery happened. So it's that old saying of uh, out of crisis comes opportunity. Yeah. But there, there was also leadership from former President uh, Bush and Clinton. Can you say something about that and how that came about? Yeah, and they, um, uh, so they had, you know, already had, um, I think, some shared, uh, crisis shared experience. relationship, yeah, crisis experience um, around the tsunami and, right. and other things. Um, and, you know, quickly were mobilized with national visibility, like uh, they were doing fundraising for national football league games that were happening and and things like that. And uh, another memory that I have of this particular time was the incredible creativity of the philanthropic sector. Hmm. So they, you know, are past political figures and yet became very important philanthropically in raising private philanthropic dollars, actually ended up creating their own philanthropic platform that it gave grants out to particular types of organizations like the HBCUs that were mm -hmm. affected in the area um, and other types of institutions that they thought were really important and then provided some funds like to these statewide funds like what we had set up. Uh, but you also saw community foundations and other types of foundations, again, immediately create sort of new types, new giving vehicles, uh, public private types of giving vehicles um, do fundraising and, and have reach that they wouldn't normally have because they were local entities uh, and really because they had the trusted knowledge of what was actually happening lo locally also show a lot of creativity. You started, I, I actually point to this time and to the work that Presidents Bush and Clinton did as sort of a first, uh, and in fact, you know, President Clinton went on to then create the, the uh, Clinton Global Initiative. This was the first sort of blurring of the public leader becoming mm. private philanthropist. I mean, it was really, you know, a platform for them to sort of flex their muscles and their profile and mm -hmm. leverage the private support for public good uh, that, that, that happened after Hurricane Katrina. You know that Pittsburgh has a very long history of uh, community philanthropy, uh, philanthropy more generally. We're seeing an emergency fund all the biggest local philanthropists come coming together to get funds into Pittsburgh. So you can definitely see that there's um, a, a history of this in lots of different places. C can you speak a little bit about, you know, we're, we're in this era of so-called fake news or actual fake news. What role did data, facts versus rumors play? Um, was it a problem? Did, were there, did it lead to actions that didn't need to happen or was it i mean the, the, this is a different era right you didn't have yeah. probably a well you didn't have a smartphone but you you probably had something yeah it it was um one there was a lot of anecdotes uh and a lot of anecdotes around you know how did the water get into the city um uh, did they release water on purpose did they release mm. the barge on purpose so there were certainly perceptions, especially of communities of color and, and uh, communities that had been marginalized uh, for a long time in the area with lots of question marks over how did this really happen and why? Huh. Um, did they really flood the city uh, or certain parts of the city on purpose? Uh, why were those parts that were, you know, for the lower income uh, or those who weren't uh, as economically resilient, why are those more affected? So 
certainly, I think in any crisis, there is a rumor mill and there's a chain of, you know, what's really happening and you can see things uh, take on a life of their own. On the other side, I would would actually point to the other side of that, though, is that policymakers really wanted to be evidence-based, but were very challenged to get the data they needed to be evidence-based. Right. You can also see, just in your comments, that crises, a crisis doesn't strike everybody in the same way. No. And different communities are, experience it in very different ways. Yeah. We're going to talk in a, in a few minutes about uh, sustainable development, but y- you really see it in a crisis. It lays bare all the, the crevices, the schisms, the inequities. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, that would be one of the one of the most striking memories as well is just to see, uh, you know, see the effects on people who were vulnerable in communities that were vulnerable beforehand. Mm-hmm. What we would term as vulnerable, you can actually see concretely what that vulnerability means. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. We're hearing a lot today, and I I'm, I know we heard it then, the term "build back better." Mm -hmm. Uh, that it's a really common thing in emergency response, this desire to to build back better. Um, How often do you think that actually occurs? And what keeps it from happening? Is it just we lose the memory? We lose the the impulse? Uh, I think there is, so I think there's a lot of pressure to repair immediately. So you mentioned early on, like you, you rightly noticed sort of the psychological trauma and the impact that it just sort of has on the psychology and identity of both people and families, but also communities in the city and, and state writ large. And there's a lot of pressure to be able to respond quickly and help meet people's immediate needs then. Um, And what that does is uh, make the process that might be necessary to be thoughtful about how to do sustainable development, how to consult with people who are going to be affected by the policies that are being made, how to ensure that the voices of those who um, were affected by those inequities actually are at the table and helping right. influence those policies. Uh, it's really, it, it's hard to create processes by which you're able to serve all those particular masters to be, to have the speed and, and agility and sort of meet, you know, the needs that people are feeling, but also be thoughtful and consultative and uh, inclusive at the time that you're putting those together. It's frustrating though, because we know that human-centered design is the best practice in all sorts of aspects of public policy. And yet we struggle. I mean, you and I were part of creating, making all voices count, a what turned out to be a $47 million effort um, internationally to elevate support reformers inside government, but also help them listen and respond to to citizens, and yet, you know, it, it feels like an important lesson in leadership that we, we just have trouble learning. So one thing I would actually also say that I think is a dynamic is that, so we talked a little bit about the creativity that happens in crisis. I think especially as you turn to recovery out of crisis, there's a huge appetite for new and big ideas, which right. is great, right? But a lot of the people who are first on the block to put those new ideas on the table are people who sort of had those ideas in their back right. pocket. So they tend to be experts and people who have thought hard about this outside of the context of this right. happening. Um, and what happens, and I, I don't think this is intentional sometimes, but what can happen is that people who actually have lived that reality and have to live with that reality get overlooked. Mm-hmm. And New Orleans you know, went through had to go through three planning processes for thinking about what their future, what the future city would look like uh, until they got one that politically stuck. Uh, And it was because the first couple, even though there were some, you know, really interesting things put on the table, it wasn't actually inclusive, of especially the communities that Mm -hmm. were most affected by and could be affected by the policies that were going to be made. 
Um, and so they got a lot of political blowback and they just didn't, you couldn't follow through on them. Uh, Speaking um, of outsiders, can you say something about the role of celebrity? Uh, I mean, obviously we, we just <laughs> talked about uh, Presidents Bush and Clinton, um, but there were other celebrities that really took this as a cause. Yeah, yeah, like Brad Pitt did, a, yep. you know, did an effort that uh, um, invested in new types of sustainable uh, uh, housing that could be sustainable, right. but also meet the needs, low, ca low cost and otherwise. Um, and in fact, you know, had a mixed record uh, over time. Is that right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think on one hand, the attention because I do feel as though people who were living there and, uh, and continue to live there and were leading that recovery uh, felt as if attention flagged at really important points. And so celebrities and others from the outside, especially luminaries like the former presidents could really reset and, and you know, reignite that attention that might be necessary at the same time, there's a balancing act because I think it has to be one that's, you know, uh, leadership with humility and leadership that listens uh, and takes its direction from sure. those, uh, those who are on the ground. And that can be about, you know, that, I mean, egos are at play and, and interests are at play and that can be a balancing act. Let's talk a little bit about coordination. Um, I want to talk about domestic versus international in a second, but we, we have a very good question from, from Rachel Chambers. The, and I know that you've written about this, the challenge of balancing the federal response, the state response versus the local response and how those channels of communication and the resources, I mean, add in also the private sector, private philanthropy, that must make it even more challenging when all these different yeah. levels are coming together um, we'll, we'll add in the international in a second, but for now, if you could just talk about the state, the federal versus state versus local. Yeah, it was, it was extremely challenging. And it's also challenging when you're in a crisis and a catastrophe at a level that overwhelms the system that was set up to serve it. So the local system, well, the all state systems, system? all, all systems. like the federal system. The federal system of response for a humanitarian disaster like that basically, you know, per, made uh, put FEMA in the middle and FEMA, uh, depending on the American Red Cross to sort of run the shelters and the immediate response, for example, that was overwhelmed. They, they just weren't able to serve the amount of people that moved and were affected and uh, um, and were looking for shelter and um, and the system in that respect broke down. And because it was a centralized system, those nonprofits I talked about that actually pivoted and churches and others uh, that uh, were doing what we call pop-up shelters uh, and were doing it for the first time, they weren't experienced you know, with, with providing humanitarian assistance. There was no real plug and play. Like there wasn't a really a system for them to plug in. The system wasn't set up to coordinate. The system was set up to be sort of a centralized hub and spoke system. But, you know, I still don't, I mean, I, I know, and we're going to talk next week with Susan Reichley about the response uh, to the Haiti earthquake. In, in those conversations, FEMA has always sort of had a bad rep. I don't understand how could FEMA not have had stress tests that would figure that they'd be able to respond better. And, and to be honest, you know, we, after we've experienced Hurricane Sandy, mm. we're gonna, this is gonna be, Miami's got all sorts of plans. There's a hundred resilient cities around the world. I mean, this is on some level, a new normal. What, what lessons do you think they've learned? Do you think they're in a better place than they were? Oh, I think they're in a much better place. And, you know, and, and I wouldn't chalk it up necessarily just to only being FEMA's fault. I mean, even look at what's happening right now with the pandemic. Uh, you had experts who said, here's your playbook. Relationships <laughs> and structures need to be created now. You need to think about prevention versus response. Mm -hmm. um, but it's very hard to get the attention of policymakers when you're talking about prevention. It's very hard to get the investments that are necessary and get the attention of, you know, folks whose inboxes are full with 
immediate crises that they're responding to to say, look, we know that when this thing happens, it's going to be bad. We need to be prepared. Um, preparation is, you know, continues to always fall sort of off the wayside in that re in that respect. I think that we absolutely have to commit to the prevention agenda. Uh, I saw Elizabeth Cousins, the president of the UN Foundation, was making this statement uh, last week in a in a conversation about both philanthropy, but also we've got to unlock that political box and make prevention a much more central agenda for a variety of reasons and in a number of spaces. Yeah, I agree. I, I, it's interesting, and you talked about 100 resilient cities, you know, the, the, what, what I think is sometimes happens as well is that we think of resilience as, um, you know, getting ready to withstand a shock or stress. That's the way we, that's the way 100 Resilient Cities, you know, defines it. And it's the way we talked about it even at USAID when we did the resilience policy. Uh, that seems sort of defensive, right? You want mm -hmm. something in place to be able to defend, to, to, mm -hmm. to withstand. Um, I think what we need to do, and this is, I think, what, what one lesson is for sustainable development. You need to talk and um, promote a set of societal well-being that has resilience right. built into it. But it's sort of a positive agenda. It's what people are going towards. So to your point, any work that we're doing, whether it's in community or, or, or it's around sort of creating a, a stronger, uh, healthier society, we have to have prevention be part of that DNA, right? We just have to think of it as part of the DNA. Right. Um, and we have to be able to be nimble uh, to be able to respond when things occur. Because the other thing, the other lesson that I, you know, really took away from this, and even I did a report, you know, you mentioned my report I did for the Aspen Institute. I had a bunch of recommendations for FEMA and the Federal Disaster Response System about how to be a lot more flexible and leverage a lot more the response that the philanthropic and nonprofit community could provide. We always end up sort of planning for the last disaster. Sure. Rather than the unknown that's sure. coming forward. And, uh, and that's our challenge. And that's why, you know, again, you know, sort of the prevention to the extent that we have it has to be part of just any way in which we think about uh, well, you, putting societies together. You saw that post 9-11. Yeah. I mean, anytime something happened, I mean, our whole response to getting on an airplane uh, is a response to what happened before. Let's stay with this theme of resiliency. Um, we have a great question. Um, we've just discussed the difficulty of getting different levels of government to care about resili resiliency before crisis. Um, the measures that were taken by cities in states to increase resiliency, environmental, financial, how would you rate them? How have they worked? Uh, and why is community resiliency not promoted at the federal and the state level? And it's interesting, um, a lot of us have been watching how different countries have responded and you see to COVID, right? And you see mm -hmm. a lot of cultural practices. So for example, Finland, F Finland experienced war, um, the Soviet Union, and it has a huge imprint in their DNA. So they are prepared. Um, they've got storage. They mm -hmm. think in terms of community resiliency. Um, they also are, you know, sort of best in practice on sustainable development. But how do we, I mean, is it a breakdown of how we are as communities that we don't think as much about community resiliency? You know, I think there are, there's a little bit of a perception that if we invest government or private resources the right way, we'll be safe, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the extent to which safety, so it's interesting because it's, it's local communities that really are the first responders when something like this happens. That, that was quite clear uh, in, in the response from Katrina. It's, it was, you know, local informal neighborhood leaders, pastors, nonprofit leaders, everyone who really were the fabric that, that led the response. Um, and that then led the recovery. I mean, I used to call New Orleans like the most uh, civically active place in the US uh, once it started to turn to recovery because everybody just knew what was going on there and they were mutually supporting each other. 
But in regular times, I think we tend to get uh, complacent and mm -hmm. look to bigger institutions, bigger structures to sort of quote unquote, keep us safe. Uh, and we don't necessarily have that as part of our DNA in the US uh, around that. I, I think we're building it. I think we're starting to flex those muscles with things like Sandy and Katrina and the recognition of what's happening on our coastal communities with climate change and what that might bring and floods in the Midwest. Uh, I think we're, we're starting to, to do that. And it's not like we, you know, as de Tocqueville said, we're a, we're a society sort of built on association and those associations mm -hmm are used to working together. But I think for larger investments, we, we've tended to get complacent and think that that's happening outside of us. Uh, whereas I think, you know, even given what's happening now with the pandemic, I think that's again, uh, a bright spot is what communities are doing amongst themselves. And, and the trick is reinforcing that and carrying that on once post crisis the, post the acute phases of the crisis um and i think we're probably more in a state now where there's got to be a higher level of readiness for anything whether it's you know climate induced or pandemic or sure. or anything like that um and and we just need to be ready for that so on this issue of coordination let's talk for a moment about crises that are both domestic and international in nature we in the u.s are not especially well organized to handle these situations given the structure of the federal government, the structure of local, and the tendencies to bifurcate the domestic from the international. You recall those slightly ridiculous meetings we'd have on the sustainable development goals where I'm in New York civitzing into the State Department, there are a bunch of people sitting around the table, but none of us own anything in the United States and <laughs> this stuff needs to be locally owned. Um, do you think, I mean, that's a real problem when we have so many policy issues that are both domestic, transnational, international, and we're just you know, not structured to be able to address this. I mean, I've been thinking about this in terms of, you know, going forward. It, someday a, a new administration comes, are we going to go back to the same, you know, it's the Domestic Policy Council yeah. and the National yeah. Security Council. And on very few occasions, I mean, I saw it in human trafficking, they'd come together, but super hard to, to have a coherent policy, coherent conversation. Yeah. Yeah. When we were even thinking about um, what the U.S., uh, what the structure might look, within, look like within the U.S. government to take the sustainable development goals seriously and to take sustainable development seriously, and we're talking about, you know, bringing together the leadership of the Domestic Policy Council with the National Security Council is just sort of unprecedented. You know, it's like, why would we would set up something on a regular basis in which they're sort of working together? Uh, we, we definitely are not set up that way, but a pandemic <laughs> almost to its very nature shows exactly. the weaknesses in that. And we're not, we're not all safe until everyone is safe. And when I say everyone, that's not just in the United States of America. That's right throughout the world and this will boomerang and come back to us. Uh, but at the same time, again, you know, when you look at the relief packages that are being put together in Congress, they are very focused on the economic and social dislocation that we're, we're experiencing here in the US. Uh, there was a little bit, but not much uh, put aside in the third stimulus, in, in the third relief package for uh, international relief and our response overseas. Really challenging in this particular sure. uh, case is just the amount of resources that are also going to be necessary, both domestically and internationally. Where will they come from and how will we manage that? Um, but I think we're actually finding uh, this is uh, a crisis in which it really highlights how important global cooperation is, and yet we are not doing very well on global cooperation to address it. Yeah, no, I mean, there's no question. This is, there's a lot of conversation about the future and whether or not we will build back better, whether or not this is the end of uh, globalization or it's a turning point in globalization. But for sure, it, it underscores the absolute need for collaboration. Um, I think that there's 
the possibility that if there is a change in administration, there's gonna you're gonna feel just a, a breeze almost uh, of, of sort of people rushing by to reestablish that kind of global alliance, global collaboration. I, you know, I suspect January 2021, this is still going to be uh, certainly a part of our lives in some way. Yeah. And this is not just about uh, government either, though. And I think right. to there may be positive pressure from the private sector on this. I mean, I was on the phone with one of the largest asset managers in the U.S. yesterday. And, you know, I was worried. I mean, one of the reasons why we were touching base, I was worried about the, you know, the craziness in the markets. And, the, and is this now changing their calculus as to investments they were going to be make that, you know, would promote sustainable development because they are one of the big, uh, one of the big advocates within the private sector and capital uh, managers around this. And they said, to the contrary, it, it actually has them doubling down, down and, it, sure. and it's really uh, accelerated and elevated the conversation around environmental and social and governance uh, dimensions within the capital markets uh, because they see it so tidely, uh, so tied to risk and management yeah. of risk and, and downside risk and upside opportunity. Um, and so they see sustainable development and the principles of sustainable development as something that they really want to promote and invest in. And they feel as though governments need to sort of get on the same page with their policies and with their cooperation to be able to do that. I, I agree. I mean, I think this is such an interesting moment for those of us who are advocates of sustainable development. If this does not make the case for elevating this yeah. issue, I don't know what does. Um, I'm curious, though, whether they have specific plans or specific asks that they're making. I mean, how do they turn that into action? Uh, it, I think it's a little early to be uh, in some respects, right. we don't know how bad this is going to get. And, right. and uh, in all we, respects. yeah, we don't know how long it will go on. So there's still a lot of uncertainty. And so um, I, I, you know, other than sort of some principles, I don't think that there's a lot of specificity around those asks. One thing that I, that I think I am hearing a lot, both from the private and public sector, though, is how vulnerable we are as a society and as our for our response to things like this, um, the more inequitable we are. Mm -hmm. and how important it is to be able to bring uh, communities and people along in to be really a part of the economy and to have the opportunity and the potential to sort of achieve uh, their potential than uh, than not and because when you're inequitable um the as you were saying before the impact is just so uh starkly different uh right. amongst different uh different places in society and so i think there's going to be a lot of focus on you know how do we ensure that uh the economic system and capitalism is working right uh, for as many people as possible and as many communities as possible. Which were issues before this happened, yeah. of course, but now it makes it, it you can't turn away from it. Yeah, it yeah. Shines a, shines a bright light. Um, we're coming up on 45 minutes. I, I want to ask two questions, but also uh, for our colleagues who are listening, if people want to type in questions, we have a little bit of time. Um, I want to ask both a policy question and then a, a question about your family. Um, on, what advice, so you get a call from the White House uh, or maybe our colleagues at CDC, maybe that's more, more, more likely. Um, what additional or final advice would you have for leaders on the front line who are dealing with, with COVID-19 today? Uh, for for those on the front line, I mean, I think the um, there is an enormous amount of value in exchange among leaders who are actually dealing directly with the crisis, mm. um, and they are as expert 
uh, themselves as outside expertise is as well. And so, for example, the, the call that Mayor Garcetti from Los Angeles uh, just put together with 40 other mayors from across the world through the C40 network. So the C40 network is, you know, cities usually uh, working with each other to reduce uh, climate emissions and right. to, to reach the Paris Agreement. And, uh, but because of those relationships, you know, have a network and the expertise that they were able to share with each other uh, and, and the importance of global cooperation just in not even necessarily, it's not like they were acting together, but exchanging their lessons and sure. their innovations together. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. Yeah, no, the relationship really issue is, is really critical. It's, it's really interesting to note, and you should take some, we should all take some comfort. Dr. Burks and uh, Dr. Redfield have worked together along with Dr. Fauci closely for decades. These are people who know one another through HIV AIDS and, and the, the struggle. Yeah. So that you can't, that's worth gold. Um, you know, we, yeah. we, we definitely found this, you know, in diplomacy, you can't, if you're in some, it's, you know, I guess the, the, the across the street UN equivalent of a crisis is you're having trouble in a negotiation, not exactly the same thing as what we're going through. But you can't do something, you can't get it done if you don't have a relationship with the person. Yeah, I, I agree. And I would also say that I think policymakers, what I would say to policymakers at this point is you need to actually make the extra effort to find people who aren't in conversation with you. Mm. Because the people who are in conversation with you right now are the ones who have the resources and capacity to do that. Right. And they may not be the people that necessarily your um, your actions and your policies need to most affect and benefit. Sure. And uh, and there's a difference between so communication is key, and we we're seeing that uh, on many different fronts, and even communications amongst policymakers is really key. Um, consultation is important, but there's a difference between communication and consultation, and actually putting people at the table and opening up decision making in a process and you need i know there's a lot of pressure to act fast but you need to be able to create processes that do that and there are ways you know with technology these days that you could actually leverage even when, even in new orleans when they were doing the process the one that actually stuck they had a uh, an organization that uh, i don't think it actually any longer exists but called america speaks that would come in and do, you know, sort of on the moment surveys with within town halls where, you know, you were doing rank voting and they were taking those sorts of inputs and being able to get input from lots of different people in a, in a short amount of time. We need to be thinking along those lines or to your point, we're gonna be setting up, uh, setting up structures that continue to be business as usual rather than taking the, and there is an advantage here. There, the, the one thing that this does is it, it sort of wipes the slate, slate clean a little bit. I mean, yeah. you saw that with public education in New Orleans afterwards, you know, a system that had been stuck for 30 years. And in fact, a lot of advocacy had become apathetic because it felt like it was never going to change. For better or for worse, they instituted a whole new system of, you know, charter schools and public financing and different ways. Um, maybe some mixed results, but definitely for some neighborhoods and for some kids, it's turned out a lot better than it had been and at least became a, a place to, um, to, to try new things where it had been very hard to get new things underway beforehand. So uh, before we break, I want to ask, we're all coming to one another from our homes um, and co-working with our, our partners and spouses. Um, how are your kids taking this? What do they, what do they think? We, our former boss, Raj Shah, was saying uh, the other day, he's been on so many public forums, it's hard to remember where he said it, but he was essentially saying, you know, his kids just don't think anymore in terms of this is domestic versus this is international. That doesn't have any meaning for them. They, they are seeing themselves as global citizens, if you will. Um, what's your sense of how your kids are understanding this? Yeah, I think I would say a little bit the same for my kids, although I think probably Raj's and I's kids are, are you know, probably 
just because of the work we do a little bit sure. more globally. You know, I have I have a daughter um, who was who was set to go to Cairo this summer actually for a month long with kids from around the world. Um, so they they have that orientation. I think the other thing that uh, I, I've I've watched. So they really miss the relationships that they have with their friends. Um, they're not getting to participate in their activities and sports and things like that. So they don't get that direct contact, but they've been very creative in ways to continue to have that contact and continue to be social. Um, and I think they are finding how important that is mm -hmm. for their own continued well-being like it's happened naturally it's not not something that we've you know pushed and i have a i have a son who's you know generally not incredibly you know social group wise but uh but it's been something that they've had to seek out and i think it just sort of goes to the core also of who we are as human beings you know we need to be social we need to sort of rely on each other, uh, especially in times like this, in a way, and they've uh, they've sought that out, and 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 it's really sustained them. I think. What's really interesting is how this is going to um, translate over time, right? I mean, my grandmother uh, grew up or was an adult during the Depression, um, and I grew up with stories about the Depression. And you know, for me, World War II is also not entirely distant. Obviously, I didn't experience it. My parents didn't experience it, but it's never been that far from my yeah. sensibility that this kind of trauma could happen and how you respond and how much this younger generation holds on to this is going to affect yeah. policy in the long run for decades. And that's going to be really very, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, um... You know, you and I talked earlier, and uh, so I had a probably four to five year experience actually uh, with the recovery in Louisiana. I ended up helping a lot of philanthropic collaboratives afterwards. I didn't live there. Um, I was sort of a trusted outside advisor because I'd been on the ground and um, I'd helped set up a, a couple of different structures. But it was very apparent to me how uh, people who were living in the Gulf Coast um, and were both people who were living in communities and then also decision makers and stakeholders who were in leadership positions that, uh, you know, policy, nonprofit work, philanthropic work continued to be seen through the lens of the experience that they'd had in Katrina. Um, and it was sort of always in the in the back of their mind. And, you know, healing from the trauma of it is a really important part of that process. And I don't know, um, maybe that, that would be one thing I would say to policymakers is we have to be attentive to what this means as sort of a collective trauma or collective identity. And, you know, the work that you've done uh, and others have done on sort of race and reconciliation processes and, and justice, um, you know, maybe there's something to be taken from that, that that we ought to be thinking about for how we collectively process this as well. Uh, because the sooner we do that, the, the more helpful it will be to us, I think. We've got two questions. Um, one is, is, it's a very good question. It's a little complicated. Um, can you lend any insights looking at COVID-19? Can you lend any insights from what you've witnessed during and following other crises that might inform how our new normal will impact domestic and international economic growth? And what else outside of the points we've covered, if any, can policymakers and private sector leaders do to stimulate rebounding from adjusting to these constraints? Yeah. It's, a, it's a great question. I think it's a really tough question. I think it's a little early, but I was talking with um, a senior official from Bear Company the other day, and he was talking about it in terms of Swiss Army knives. Yeah, so when when um, when 9-11 happened, you know, people who might travel with Swiss Army knives all the time, they would come up to the security and they just yep. had to throw them away. Right. Yep. Yep. It's like that's going to happen to a lot of things. We don't mm. know what exactly yet, but things that we took as norms or we invested in or we bought or we had, you know, because of the processes and protocols we set up 
uh, to be more resilient or to sort of take account of a new normal, those things may go away. You know, you saw China open up movie theaters uh, in Wuhan and then close them a couple of days right. later. Um, so what might that mean for certain types of industries and, uh, you know, look what's happening right now with how we're getting used to working without traveling to go see each other all the time. Mm -hmm. What might that mean for the airline industry? Now that that's, it's also, so it's both a positive and a negative, right? I mean, it's going to negatively affect certain industries, certain things. It also presents opportunity on the other right. side that maybe we haven't even imagined yet, right? right. But right. there's definitely going to be shifts in the economy because of it. Right. You know, I, I think we've got to double down on our resilience and understanding that there are going to be waves, it's going to be opening up and closing back down. And if that happens, we have to have a long game view of this, um, but always to be looking for the opportunities that arise from a crisis like this. Uh, and you're right, there are, there are a lot of things that, that can be done and lessons to be learned. Um, Tony, I want to thank you for your time uh, and your experience that you're bringing to the table. Um, I think we've all learned a lot from it. Um, we're going to do this again uh, next Friday at 12.15 with our good friend and colleague, Susan Reichley, uh, who lived through somewhat different experience, um, but one that was certainly equally intense, um, and, uh, and that is USAID's response to the the earthquake in Haiti in um, January through all of 2010 and into 2011. So let me let me thank you. I don't know how there's I don't know that there's a virtual way for everybody to hand clap. <laughs> I'm sure there is. Um, probably the Zoom <laughs> gods and goddesses know how to do that. Oh, there we go. We see some hand clapping. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, there, there, there. Uh, Maria, actually, if you want to come on and tell me how to do that, I will. I At will the bottom that. of the screen, there's a reactions button. Oh. If you click on that, you can do a thumbs up. You can do a clap. <laughs> so. There we go. Okay. All right. Okay. So You're leading the witnesses, Sarah. Yes. Well. <laughs> Well, it's been a pleasure, and thanks for having me. It's uh, it, you know, it's it's helpful for me actually to even reflect on those lessons, especially where we are in the midst of things right now. And like I said, we're still in the midst of uh, like the acute phase, and so um, I think we're, there's a lot for us to take lessons from the past, especially as we start to get a little bit of our breath and turn toward recovery. But this will be unlike anything else because it is so globally connected. Right. And so we have to recover as a globe in a, some sort of coordinated way. And that's a real challenge right now, given the state of the multilateral system and the level of global coordination. There is nothing that has reminded us that we are all of one planet like this. So, exactly. yeah. all right. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Thanks for putting up with my, my windows that have all the lights. <laughs> um, we are a, uh, a work in progress. Um, but, and thanks Marie for helping organize and all my Heinz College uh, colleagues who were out there um, elevating this, this conversation. So everybody be safe, stay inside as much as possible, social distance, um, get a breath of fresh air when you can uh, and take care of one another. Bye now. Thanks very much, be safe. <laughs>